I was born at an age where I was young and attractive enough that I met Gore Vidal, Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, you know, just everybody who was around at that time because they would look around and see this, you know, cute guy and, you know, okay, you come join us over here type of thing. Want to listen to this episode ad-free? Head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash ivory tower boiler room and get a free trial for the itbr professor level and you can actually watch this episode as a video episode as well while you're at it did you know that on spotify we now have a subscription service for ten dollars a month you get access to all of our ad free episodes plus any bonus episodes So make sure that you rate, review, and follow the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Make sure that you follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And follow Mary DePippi's show, True Crime and Academia, at True Crime and Academia. Thank you all for your support. And without further ado, here's today's episode. Are you looking for a new magazine to read where you can get so many book, film, and TV recommendations? Well, then you need to check out the Gay and Lesbian Review. The GNLR is a bi-monthly magazine of history, culture, and politics that publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies and a number of special features. Each issue brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles focused on a unifying theme. So for example, their new issue for May and June is called The Celluloid Fishbowl. And it's a nod to Vito Russo's 1981 book called The Celluloid Closet, which documented the flashes of LGBT content in movies before Stonewall when such content was strictly forbidden. So there's so many exciting articles in the May and June issue, including one by Andrew White called Queer Ghosts on Oscar Night that covers so many different LGBTQ films, both when the characters come out of the closet and what happens when characters are already openly queer and they don't need to come out of the closet like we're seeing with so much of TV and film and literature right now. There's also an article by Andrew Holleran, the acclaimed writer of Dancer from the Dance, who actually reviews All of Us Strangers, which I can't wait to watch and has been much talked about. So please make sure that you use the Ivory Tower Boiler Room code ITBR50 When you go on glreview.org, you'll see on the right side, it says subscribe. You can either subscribe for their digital edition, or if you're like me, I like to still get the magazine uh, delivered as a print magazine. There's nothing just like having a print magazine in front of you. So use ITBR50 to get 50% off of your GNLR subscription. Yes, that's 50% off. So enjoy your reading, and please, if you are subscribing to the Gay and Lesbian Review, and if there's an article you really enjoyed, or a review you really liked, or a guest that you really want me to interview from the Gay and Lesbian Review, make sure that you DM me at Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Happy reading, everyone, and thank you to the Gay and Lesbian Review for their sponsorship. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. So this is one of my favorite times where I meet with a gay and lesbian review contributing writer, in this case, a very prolific writer. So I need to give him his accolades. I'm with Felice Picano, who is the author of more than 30 books of poetry, fiction, memoirs, nonfiction, and plays. His work has been translated into many languages. Several of his titles are national and international bestsellers. He is considered a founder of modern gay literature, quite a, you know, hefty weight to carry, along with the other members of the Violet Quill, which we're going to go all into. 
He also began and operated the Seahorse Press and Gay Presses of New York. I especially love Calamus Press because of my Whitman scholarship mm -hmm. for 15 years. His first novel was a finalist for the Penn and Hemingway Award. Since then, he's been nominated for and won dozens of literary awards. And currently he is in Los Angeles, where he also teaches at Antioch College. So welcome, Felice, to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Thank you, Andrew. So I have to ask you first just about the Violet Quill, because I feel like it'll launch a thousand conversations, which in 2021 from the Gay and Lesbian Review, I loved David Bergman's article kind of looking at that 40 year perspective of the Violet Quill Club. Just for our listeners out there, how did the Violet Quill get started? What was its premise when you first joined and, you know, bringing us into this literary society of sorts? Okay, so it was 1978 and there were seven of us and we were all friends, lovers or boyfriends, mm. right? Andrew Holleran uh, knew Robert Farrell and Michael Rumbly, who were longtime lovers, and he knew them from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. I knew Edmund White socially and Chris Cox, who was his boyfriend at the time, socially. And about a year and a half before that, I started dating um, George Whitmore. So we were all connected up like that. And we were really just looking for um, other gay writers to discuss what gay writing, you know, what gay literary fiction would be, could be, and how we would go about doing it. And we needed someone to share, um, to listen to what we were writing, because n nobody around us, and Edmund had a whole bunch of fancy literary friends, and they said, gay writing, that must be pornography, you know? And so really nobody took it seriously. So we wanted to read our new and evolving work to each other. And th that was the main uh, focus of the group. Well, uh, and you seven of us would read, we would meet once every couple of weeks and all seven of us would read something and discuss it. Well, and you had just come out with one of your best-selling books, right? As had Andrew Holler Holleran, from what I remember. I mean, Andrew Holleran had Dancer from the Dance. And then what novel had you just come out with, Felice? The Lure, yeah, I'd come out with The Lure. At the and time. what is the premise of The Lure? Like, what's the narrative centered uh, on? Well, the, what it's based on are uh, a series of articles that were written in The Village Voice um, about uh, serial gay murders in uh, New York City in 1976, 1977. Um, and um, the story had been dropped, but I had picked it up. And I was I, I, initially, I was going to uh, try to offer it to movie companies. And in fact, I did initially offer it to movie companies. Um, I was also, besides being in New York, and this, no, none of the Violet Quill Club knew until many years later. I was also um, by coastal and working out in uh, Hollywood doing script writing and stuff like that. This was all, you know, below literary level. So I couldn't, I would just say I'm out in the sun, you know. <laughs> uh, but um, I wanted, I offered it as a movie and nobody really picked it up. And I mentioned it to my editor in New York who had done uh, three of my books very successfully. Before that, Linda Gray, wonderful editor, and she said, Felice, if you can't do a movie, it's a book. Mm. Well, and it's so funny because I'm not sure if you saw American Horror Story, um, New York City, but a few years ago, it all centered on the TV show Queer Men in um, mostly Hell's Kitchen or even Greenwich Village, and they were at the bars, and it was all about these murders and like the luring of cruising. Yeah. Uh, so I think you were ahead of the curve, Felice. In many ways, Andrew, not <laughs> always a comfortable position to be in. I have well, to say. Yeah, I was going to say, like you faced so many 
obstacles and especially really being at that forefront of taking risks and chances, you know, what even really led you into that creative writing space? Because I know you grew up on Long Island and then you would every like year go to the Radio City Christmas Spectacular. Absolutely. Yeah. I ended up living in, in, uh, Manhattan when I was in college I went to Queens College of the City of New York uh New York University uh City of University of New York and um most of the time that I was in college I was living in Alphabet City with a roommate in a $55 and 40 cent apartment rental a month apartment and but other people from um Queens College moved into that area too um, so there was, because nobody, you know, it was the worms away, away from home type of thing. Um, so I was uh, interested in Manhattan from a very early age and lived in there while I was still in my teens. Mm. Was it really? Uh, I had just, I had just turned 20 when I graduated college. Mm. Was it really that? you know, Rent portrayal, like I'm sure you know Rent the Musical and how centered it is on Alphabet City in the 90s and that whole bohemian artistry. was Is that an accurate portrayal or do you feel like they really fantasized elements? Well, I moved out in um, 1977. Mm -hmm. I moved out of Alphabet City because um, I was being robbed like every month. <laughs> And it had turned in the 60s, the, the mid 60s and the late 60s. It was wonderful. Uh, by 1968, 69, it had become a drug paradise and it attracted exactly the wrong type of people. And, you know, uh, it was not really livable at that point. I don't know what happened there in the 90s. By the 80s and 90s, there was a really great scene. And Calamus Press, for example, came out of that scene. Larry Mitchell lived there. There were all these people there um, who were artistic and were writers. And um, there was theater there. It really was quite a, a wonderful scene. So it was wonderful in one way when I was there. Went to hell for about five, six, maybe 10 years and then popped up again. So rent is sort of accurate, yeah. Yeah, and now it's a very expensive place to live. So things yeah, have turned yeah. around. I went to a party there a few years yeah. ago. Um, but for, so Calamus Press, what I'm really have to ask you with my own research is, are you indebted to Walt Whitman? Like where did the name, you know, how did that okay. enter your psyche? Let me, well, I, Whenever I te when I was teaching poetry, even the first time I taught poetry somewhere in New York as a guest lecturer, I always began the course with Walt Whitman and with his homoerotic poems, which nobody seemed to know. And we're talking about in the 80s and 90s. You know, I would start, okay, let me read these poems. Bum, bum, bum. And then there was like a whole series of them. People would come up to me afterwards and say, who knew? I said, yeah, they don't, they don't select those when they're doing selective poems, you know. Anyway, so he was always very important to me. And I love the fact that he was an opera queen <laughs> and that he would cruise. Uh, he had a boyfriend who was a bus driver, an omnibus driver. And I, he just seemed so contemporary to me as a figure, you know, um, that I really felt close to him. Plus, when I did a reading with Allen Ginsberg at Hunter College, pretty early in my life, um, it was he and I and two women poets, and he had invited me to join it. He spent the time that the women who went first, when they were there reading, which was about almost an hour, he spent most of that time trying to seduce me. <laughs> I, I looked younger always looked younger than I was, and he liked younger people. And I think that the great line was that if we could trace back all the guys who had slept with everyone, it went back to, it went back past Oscar Wilde and to Walt Whitman. And I said, that's a great pickup line. I, I believe you're on next. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm now writing a book proposal for my dissertation, but it's called Whitman's Queer, um, uh, The Pool of Narcissus, Walt Whitman's Homoerotic Poetics. And I open with Oscar Wilde and Whitman in Camden, New Jersey. So it's really interesting. I'm curious, mm -hmm. like my work is all about the ancient Greek influences on Whitman and like mm -hmm. how that really speaks for same-sex desire without trying to categorize him as gay and like falling into all these biographical traps that can happen and and instead just see huh. like you've expressed in all of your work that queer male desire has been existing it doesn't have to always be blatantly named like you know the poetry exists and like you we have to breathe that type of air of just understanding the different relationships um huh. but i'm like so curious your whole life it feels you know, still, of course, Felice ongoing is like a who's who in the literary scene. And I mean, to think of you with Allen Ginsberg and his poem, A Supermarket in California, it's almost as if you were the grocery boy that that speaker is eyeing. I mean, um, you know, what was it not like? Quite. <laughs> not, not, not quite. Not quite. Okay. But um, no, I, it, it's interesting. Uh, I was born in 1944. So next week I'm going to be 80 years old. And what that's all about is that I was born at an age where I was young and attractive enough that I met Gore Vidal, Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, you know, just everybody who was around at that time because they would look around and see this, you know, cute guy and, you know, okay, you come join us over here type of thing. Sorry for the interruption, but this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I have to talk to you all about the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Yes, you might be saying, but wait, aren't I listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room? You are. You're listening to the podcast. But when I'm not here in the podcast space, I'm actually consulting. So I have small businesses that I help consult with their social media marketing plan. I help fellow podcasters or those who are looking to go into podcasting. And I've also just met with a client and I can't wait for her podcast to come out. So I've also helped those in the college admission process with their essay editing. I helped someone on her thesis and actually edited and helped consult her all the way through her thesis. I'll help you with your dissertation since I just got done my dissertation uh, last summer. So you can reach out to me at ivorytowerboiltheroom at gmail.com. Yes, I monitor my email every day. My first hour consultation is done virtually usually, and it's $30 for the first hour, and then we'll figure out what plan will work for you. So again, you can reach out to me via email, or you can also look me up on Google, Ivory Tower Boiler Room. You'll see my cell phone number there. Please do feel free to call me or DM me on Ivory Tower Boiler Room's Instagram. So I ended up actually meeting so many interesting people um, that would not have happened uh, otherwise. And so I feel like I'm on some sort of a cusp here. And the same thing uh, working in Rosoli uh, before I became a published author. Over there where I met, you know, the world at that time walked into that bookstore. Um, so I was very lucky in that regard. And I enjoyed it. But to go back to Kellamus Press, here's the background of Gay Press of New York. I started what it turns out to be the first gay uh, publishing company in the world <laughs> in early 1977, the Seahorse Press. I chose the Seahorse as a, the symbol because the Seahorse is one of uh, a few uh, creatures in nature where the male actually give birth. So it was all about creative males, right? And a couple of years later that year, a, a man named Larry Mitchell began a press called Calamus Press. So he's the founder of Calamus. A year and a half later, Terry Helbing, who was in gay theater or what was developing as gay theater, started JH Press. And a year later, we met and began Gay Presses of New York. 
Mm. So the whole thing, I became the editorial director, but it took two of us to bring in a new book under this new imprint. And the first book that we brought in under the new imprint of Gay Presses of New York was an unfinished trilogy by this guy nobody knew called, and it was Torch Song Trilogy. So we were in the black from day two, you know, essentially. Um, and I ended up running the presses when um, both of my uh, partners uh, eventually failed in hell. And um, so that's my connection to it. Um, I was the general liaison um, for the presses while continuing to run my own company. But when um, Terry had an accident and went into a coma, I ended up running JH Press. And when Larry started going blind, I ended up running Calvinist Press, which, by the way, is back in is back in print in some form. In that his book, "The Faggots and Their Friends Between Revolutions," has been republished in exactly the same format as originally, and that was the big bestseller of Calvinist Press. Wow! Wow! Well. Yeah, the unknown person Felice is talking about is Harvey Firestein, of course. Right. But, and I hope Harvey has a large dedication to you in his new memoir, Felice. Well, he, he, he mentions us. I mean, we're just a spot along his path to success, you know, but that's okay. He mentioned us nicely. More importantly, however, is that when he won the Tony Award, mm. got up on television and thank his producers, but also thank the three of us who, as he said, had faith in his play before anyone else. And in fact, when it came to us, it was two plays that had been produced and one that he was still finishing. So I ended up editing those plays three times. Yeah. Yeah, I saw the revival that had like um, encompassed them together, like brought... Uh -huh you know, the whole trilogy together. Um, it was very well done. Um, so yeah, the who's who list of you being at Rizzoli Books, which, what neighborhood was that in, Felice? That was in the Diamond neighborhood. Oh, interesting. It was, in fact, okay. the, it was called the Diamond Corner of New York City in Manhattan. And it was 53rd Street and Fifth Avenue because it was an L. The, yes, yes. The story. And uh, Harry Winston, Tiffany, <laughs> yeah. just all the famous diamond stores were around us. And in fact, we shared a basement wall with Harry Winston. Um, so it was the diamond court. Where now the Trump, the Trump Tower is, was uh, George Yale Jensen, um, the glass and high-end um, home store. So that's where it was. And people would meet there and then go to dinner. Oh, okay. So is that at why? One point, at one point in the evening, just before I was going home, Maria Callas appeared as though out of nowhere, all dressed up, you know, looking like an advertisement. And she was obviously meeting someone there to go to dinner, which she did, you know. So that's why you would have Jackie Onassis, Bette Midler, um, Jerome Robbins, like why there was just so many different oh, artists Gregory coming Jack together. Quinn, um, Dolly, I am pay, name it. Um, you know, I ended up selling furniture in the gallery, a du buffet suite of furniture in the gallery to Elton John for his new chateau and stuff like that. I mean, it was crazy, crazy, you know. Do you feel like we've lost those kinds of touchstone spaces in this digital, digital age? Because I feel like it, it would be hard to have a who's who in the art scene in that concentrated way. It's interesting because that maybe is true. But you know what we have? I'm not sure about that, whether we've lost that. New York was definitely a center there. And um, when I became friends with... Um, a variety of older people, they said, well, you know, this was like, Paris was like this in 1926. 
Mm. And I'm sure if you went back to Paris in 1895 or London in 1860, there were these moments where all the talent came together in one place. What I do know we have lost for sure is Bohemia, the Bohemia of rent and of New York City in the 70s and 80s. Um, and that has gone. But there is a visual representation of much of it which was done by a young photographer from Texas who was doing uh, the first uh, MFA in photography at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, he came to New York City because you know, he wanted people to pose in bathtubs and nobody would in Texas, but of course everybody would in New York City. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got a call from from one person and posed in the airport in the bathtub. I uh, sent him off to uh, Robert Maplethorpe who posed, who sent him off to Divine, to Cookie Mullet, to this one and that one and that one. And, that. and now there is there's a show of that ever since um, that has gone around the world. When I was in Retrovic in, in 2004, uh, doing a, a a travel piece, a travel cover for Red Iceland, uh, which was just getting hot at that time. Um, there were life-size photos of me in a bathtub and Divine in some art gallery there. <laughs> and it keeps coming back, you know. Mm. So if you look at that, that was a bohemia that could not be uh, assembled all over again and never again, I think. Yeah. Well, so what are some of the lessons or maybe things that surprised you from, you know, being around your whole life, just the arbiters of style or the cutting edge avant-garde scene? Like, what did you learn from just being in this proximity? I mean, did it just help influence and shape your own creative style? I don't know. You know, I'm not sure about that at all. I'm not sure what you, you mentioned in, in your email about influencers, like influencers from W.H. Arden. Well, I have to tell you, I knew him socially. <laughs> we became nice friends, not great friends, nice friends. I never talked to him about being a writer. He was not really interested in that. Um so I knew him in, in a social basis, you know. Um, he didn't really influence me in any way. I didn't start reading him in any kind of depth until after he passed, frankly. Um, he would have, he had gotten two um, big jobs around the time that I met him, just a couple of years before he went to back to Europe, which was pretty much a disaster for him, by the way. He hated being in England. Um, he didn't, he had lived for 40 years on the Lower East Side, on St. Mark's Place. He was used to young people. He was used to, you know, being able to walk up to somebody and start talking to them. He was treated like some sort of a Buddha, as he said, once he got to Oxford. And it was just awful. He would... On Saturday nights, he would go into town. He's just telling me this on the telephone. He would go into town looking for American tourists to talk to, literally, you know. <laughs> it was it was sad. It was sad. Um, but before that, he he had gotten um, the New York Times. Uh, New Yorker had asked. They said that you're on retainer. Any poem you write, will publish. Uh, the New York Review of Books said any essay you write will publish. And so Olin Fox, who was his amanuensis, um, would throw these dinner parties and a whole bunch of us would go. And Auden would throw out some question or topic and everybody would talk about it. And a month later, we'd see all of our opinions <laughs> in these articles <laughs> in the um, New York Review of Books. He never read his poetry to us. Mm. You know? Yeah. And uh, if anything, he talked. We talked a lot about music, um, geology. He was very interested in geology. Um, I met the Stravinsky's at his place, and we talked about that. Um, you know, so that's what it's like. So my influences, I think, and I'm actually writing a big book of essays 
these days um, called Dickens at the Beach and other essays. And it's about the five or six writers that had the most amount of influence on me. Because I did, I, I did a lot of reading in depth pretty quickly once I started reading. Um, and Henry James, Thomas Mann, Balzac, um, they only read in Europe nowadays. Um, and um, very early on, also Dickens, you know. So these are my influences. Uh, Dickens taught me a lot. Henry James taught me. Thomas Mann taught me. They all taught me as a writer what to do. And I didn't realize that until 40 years later. Mm. Yeah. Capote, on the other hand, I read as his books were coming out, and I'm sure he had some sort of influence. Um, I really do consider him a major, major writer. Somebody reviewing one of my books compared me to him, and I sent them flowers. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's incredible. Of his writing, you know. Well, and it's so interesting because I loved your... Uh, November, December article about you were reviewing a fictional piece of Truman Capote, a novel that had come Stephen out. Greco. But like Stephen Greco's wonderful novel, Such Good Friends, which I recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and now I'm sure, you know, Lawrence Lemur's yeah, Capote's yeah. Women has really like taken off because of the feud show, which I'm watching. And kind of the way you've described W.H. Auden, it seems like Capote, I mean, he was a very extroverted personality. I mean, it seems just from even how they're portraying him, but he was really using this high society group of women to gain insight and psychological knowledge for his narratives or just material. Like, mm -hmm. I um, agree with that, yeah. so that's a pretty fair portrayal, you feel, of what he was like in the social yeah. scenes. Yeah. Um, his, his lover, Jack Dumphy, saw the introverted side of him. I mean, I lecture, I, you know, teach, I do all kinds of things that are extroverted. But of course, I have an introverted side, which allows me to just close out the world and do writing. And Capote was like that. When we talk about stuff, the one time that I really had a long conversation with him, we talked about that. I said, you know, fuck these ladies, do your writing, you know? <laughs> and said, that's oh, gonna be the quote of the interview <laughs> but yeah. i mean oh, really i mean you know it was he was he had he, he was uh an abused and neglected child mm. he really was i mean and his parents were you know deeply neglectful and not very nice to him in terms of boosting his ego. So he had to do it by himself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key to um, Truman uh, and his life. But his work really stands apart from that. He was able to focus on some really important issues um, but the, the whole thing with these society ladies was, oh, they like me, they like me, they like me. Mm. Yeah, well, they're like calling the show the first real housewives um, that they really, you know, pull the strings of society and like their in-group fighting and issues to the outside. People would say, what's the big deal? Like they're fighting over a bill at a restaurant or like who's going to be hosting the next gala. But like to them, that was the biggest high their stakes life. issue. Yeah. yeah, that's their life. Yeah. That was um, their life. Yeah. But his yeah. life was bigger than theirs, you know. Mm hmm It's well, interesting. I, yeah. No, no, so, no, go ahead. I, it's interesting because I met, you know, some of those people, especially, well, at one point, Rose Kennedy was coming into the store because she was doing her uh, memoirs up the street at Doubleday. And she walked in the store one day and, I was up in the manager's office doing something. They called me down and she said, my daughter-in-law, Jackie Kennedy, tells me you're wonderful about photographs and I have to have photographs um, for my um, thing, for my autobiography and I don't trust that woman. <laughs> I double day to choose them. So she spreads out, she opens this thing and spreads out all these photos. 
I write about this and we go through them and we're talking about them. She came in a couple of other times and one time she was in there and she said, is that Mrs. Rockefeller there? And there was Mrs. Nelson D, not Nelson, John D. Rockefeller III. You know, pe particular people would come in for particular things. She liked European faience of the 18th century. That was her thing. A new book would come in, we'd call her up, she'd come in, <laughs> you know? So she happened to be there. And Rose says to me, we met, but she probably doesn't know who I am. Could I, could you introduce me to her? So there I am introducing Rose Kennedy to Mrs. John D. Rockefeller III. <laughs> and I invite them up to the art gallery where we have, you know, coffee set up up there. They go up there and they have coffee. Who, who does this happen to, this type of stuff, you know? Well... It sounds like a scene from Southampton. Um, like to me, Gosh. that's where when I've been at the Hamptons, those types of connections and networking, like Truman really got thrown in the network and tossed in, yeah. Tossed in, yeah. And that was yeah. a life raft for him of yeah. sorts. A special thank you to the April Virtual Book Club members. We read Wicked by Gregory Maguire, and I'm going to be releasing that book club episode soon on our Patreon because if you're a Patreon member, you actually can listen back to our book club discussions, which is really exciting. And thank you to the book club members for allowing that to happen. So for May, I actually have a poll up right now on ivorytowerboilerroom.com. Scroll down to events and you'll see that neck and neck, it really is neck and neck. Right now, the two books are either The Book of Gothel by Mary McMinn, which is a retelling of Rapunzel, but from Gothel, Mother Gothel's viewpoint, who's seen as a villain, similar to Alphaba and Wicked, or we're going to read Blonde by Joyce Carol Oates, which fictionalizes Marilyn Monroe's life and is what the Netflix film was based on. So please get your votes in as soon as possible, and I'll announce the winner on May 1st. But again, it's not necessarily a winner because I think we're going to read the other book in June since it is so close. And it's such a heated contest for which book we're going to read. And also, you can put in a book that you recommend for us to read, and I'm definitely going to take that into account. Let's just say we might be reading The Great Gatsby this summer because I think we're going to see it on Broadway. Spring has sprung here on Long Island, and I'm excited to talk about The Soapbox NY, a bath and body boutique located in historic Port Jefferson Village. My good friend Janine Cucci co-owns the Soapbox NY. Not only has she been on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room podcast, but she's also been on my good friend Christian Garcia's podcast. So she gave me a special spring scent from her blending bar. You might ask Andrew, what is the blending bar? Well, it's what makes the Soapbox NY so unique in my opinion. They have over 200 essential oils that can be made into shower gel, bubble baths, shampoo, body lotion, an essential oil roller, or even perfume. So the first scent that I want to highlight is called Peony Blush Suede, an exquisite floral with delicate rose and honey accents and a subtle green freshness. The second is mimosa and tonka with notes of sweet golden mimosa mixed with creamy tonka bean. And the third is spring musk, green and fresh with notes of bergamot, orange blossom, and neroli, a clean and fresh musk. So head over to SoapboxNY.com to place your order. Make sure you follow the Soapbox NY on Instagram, where you also could DM Janine with any questions. And make sure you tell her that Andrew from Ivory Tower Boiler Room sent you. You've heard me gush over my friend Christian Garcia's podcast called That Old Gay Classic Cinema. Yes, Christian Garcia, who hosts the Smash Rewatch podcast series with me. Remember Smash, where they're putting on a Marilyn Monroe Broadway musical called Bombshell? Well, make sure you listen to our podcast series. His podcast is called That Old Gay Classic Cinema, and it is definitely meant for all of those Turner classic movie lovers. So he looks at classic films with a queer lens. So think of him 
as a queer cinema professor of sorts. He actually had on co-owner of the Soapbox NY, Janine Cucci, to talk about Sunset Boulevard, which the three of us are just obsessed with Sunset Boulevard, and we can't wait for Nicole Scherzinger to be in the revival of Sunset Boulevard on Broadway. He also has episodes about Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Strangers on a Train, now that definitely is a queer homoerotic film, The Philadelphia Story, Meet Me in St. Louis, Beauty and the Beast, Sweet Charity, Psycho Mary Poppins, Hello Dolly, The Wizard of Oz, Vertigo, which I actually was on, and 101 Dalmatians, and the list can go on and on and on. So make sure that you listen to That Old Gay Classic Cinema wherever you get podcasts, like Spotify or Apple. Follow Christian on Instagram at That Old Gay Classic Cinema, and he also has a TikTok. And please make sure that you reach out to him and let him know that you heard this ad on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Happy podcast listening. Um, well, and you spent so many, I mean, I'm sure you still, you know, have a foot in the pines, but I'm a huge fan of Fire Island because I live on Long Island, only mm-hmm. 30 minutes away in Port Jefferson Village. And um, on, the North Shore. on the North Shore, yes. North Shore, um, yeah. Were you a North Shore or South Shore Long Islander? Felice? Well, both, actually, because we summered um, on the North Shore. Um several years when I was a teenager yeah. and um, Locust Valley, a place, uh, a sort of yes. high end um, little enclave called Locust Valley. And interestingly enough, when I was 15, 16 years old, I met a bunch of those rich kids there, um, mm. you know, because uh, part of being, my father was looking for, he was expanding his business. He was a grocer who expanded into uh, wholesale warehousing and um, catering to airlines and big hotels and everything. And he was looking for an investor and he found one who wanted to invest in his business to expand it. And uh, the guy said, I have this house in Lucas Valley. Nobody uses it. Uh, Why don't your family use it during the summer? So we ended up there a couple of um, summers. And along with it came the keys to the beaches and the clubs and everything. So I ended up, uh, me and my sister ended up hanging out with all these rich kids. Yeah, yeah. After, I love, I love Locust Valley. Um, yeah. But yeah, and then I'm sure you know, like how... Um, Huntington Village, like they have such an LGBTQ scene with Cinema Arts Center. And there is, you know, a lot now happening on Long Island, which is wonderful. Um, But did you feel that with the Pines? You know, when did you first start going to the Pines? Like how different was this? Almost like a fantasy, I'm assuming, from you being from, you know, the main shore of Long Island. Right. Um... I knew it was there. I first went out to the straight communities with people I was working with at the East End Welfare Center. I was a welfare worker for two years. And I was in a group of um, very active and also psychoactive because they all took drugs. You know, we all took drugs for a very long time. Um, And we went out to um, uh, the the straight communities there. Um, And I was out there for two summers and had a great time and enjoyed it. But the uh, women in the house, the second year said, we hate this single scene here. We just want to go out dancing without being hit. Let's go to Cherry Grove. So we would all pile into beach taxis, take our drugs and uh, go dancing in Cherry Grove, you know. And there were signs on the wall there that said no more than three men to each woman. (laughs) <laughs> on the dance floor and we would appear with five women and so we were very popular um so i got to see that scene and it was interesting it looked interesting but it was i was only there at night you know during those years and then i went out to fire island pines with, because 
um, a friend of a friend, uh, an old guy who was a stockbroker, had a house at Far Island Pines. And we ended up going for a week, sometimes four days, three days. Um, and so I got to see it then. It was in transition then from a family um, community, which it had been originally, um, into a gayer community. It was not very, not usually gay then. By 1973, there was a large gay community there. And that's when the big theme parties started happening. There were, in, I mean, every year for 15 years, there were enormous theme parties. They attracted people from outside of Fire Island, um, as well as people in Fire Island. And that was by 1975, when I started renting a house out there during the whole summer, um, it was what I call the class of 75. There were many, many gay uh, men there. Mm. I'd say more than half at that point. And from then until 1985, that was true. Mm. Well, I was going to say, like, my knowledge of um, the difference between Cherry Grove and the Pines history is the Pines was, like, very white gay male oriented, where Cherry Grove was more of, like, the integrated lesbian, gay, bisexual, a little more free-flowing with, like, identity. Is that, like, an accurate portrayal? It's an accurate portrayal. There was, there was, despite what people said, there was lots and lots of partying going on at Fire Island Pine. A lot of it was private. Uh, I mean, I went. We had uh, two uh, Islip uh, PD policemen there. We ended up partying with them, both in Fire Island Pines during the week, and. My lover and I came upon them, Julio and Red, came upon them in New York City one weekend. And they they said, where are you going? And we said, we're going to Flamingo. Come on, come in, be our guest. So they came to Flamingo with us. You know, And they were straight. These were straight, handsome, good looking guys. They got a lot of women, but they were straight. You know, So it really was a party activity there, a great deal. And lots and lots of sex, you know. Mm. Well... You know, you couldn't believe how much. Well, and I know like the, you know, top like fashion uh, designers. I'm trying to remember whose house Calvin was Klein in the Pines. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Calvin Klein and Holston were my neighbors. Yeah. You know. Wow. So, you know, when they were there or that artist or fashion community, the who's who of the gay scene, you know, Tommy again. Came out there, you know. James Levine from the opera. Yeah, but were they very, like you said, the Pines was a very private place. Like they weren't right. really trying to like talk to everyone on the island. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. But the thing is, there was a great intermesh between the two communities because many of us would go dancing Saturday night in the Ice Palace in Terry Grove. You know, and that was the place to be on a Saturday night. And a lot of them would come to Back to the Pines for the Sunday tea dance, which began attracting, you know, straight people from all over Fire Island and from Long Island, too. So these things became institutionalized pretty quickly, you know. So what what is that origin, Felice? Because I've gone to the tea dance last summer. I was there with my now huh. boyfriend. We weren't dating then, but... Um, we're now dating. Um, so, yeah, what? why is it called the tea dance? Like, what is that whole ritual about? Well, tea dances came from the 1920s. It's interesting. And in, when I was going to um, Studio 54, me and my lover would see this couple in their 60s, a, a woman mm. in great condition, tall, slender guy in great condition, and they'd be out there dancing and doing swing dancing and things like that. This is that Studio 54. Nobody talks about this, right? One day we sat there on the back desk and I said, why are you here? How are you here? And they said, this is the best, best dancing at this time since the 30s and 40s when we were young and dancing. So it's like eras, 
you know, there's a cyclical thing. And I think that's what was happening in Fire Island. There was something going on in the Grove there in the 20s, 30s, in the 30s. In fact, Auden told me that it wasn't as big as what it became, but the cycle came back again, hit in the middle of the 1970s, and it took off again <clears throat> in the city also. Wow. Well, I've stayed at the Belvedere twice, so I need to know, Felice, what was the Belvedere like when you were, you know, first at Cherry Grove or like what was even its legacy? Like, was it something people talked about a lot? Well, it was a wonderful, a strange looking place. It was terrific. Um, I only saw it when I went home with people who were staying there, living there, <laughs> which was more than once. Um, it was supposedly built, you know, during that first hot period of the of the cherry grove, and um, I'm not sure there was a legend about it, but you know, I don't really remember the legend. You'll probably know that better than I, you know. Yeah. Well, I know they were trying to the owner. I mean, I know the owner, the new owner, um, um, Julius, but. Um, I remember that it was all curated to like really try to replicate like the Italian mansion, like almost an ancient oh, Roman. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I vaguely remember that. Yeah. 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 So there's like a lot of like ancient Roman or Italian art spread throughout the place. Yeah. I do remember yeah. that. Yeah. But it's still, you know, going strong. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The Ice Palace has a new pool that they've put in. Uh, so. Yeah, that's good. That's that was good. the greatest. I the greatest dancing me and my dance partners ever did was there and in uh, uh, you know Flamingo probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, Saint, the Saint was another place. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess it was a party generation. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, you know, a book that I just really, I mean, you have such a story literary career, but, and you're still writing as we all know. Um, one of my favorites though, from 2007 is when you wrote art and sex in Greenwich village. And like, I just am so curious because a place we haven't talked about yet is Greenwich village, which is actually interesting because people think of Stonewall. They think of all like these LGBTQ monuments in Greenwich village. So like, what is your relationship to such a, your male space in Manhattan. So I, I, I was still pretty young when I moved there. I moved there from Alphabet City and promptly went to Europe for a year. And, <laughs> and my ex-girlfriend from high school and her new husband lived there um, and commuted to Princeton, right, uh -huh. where he, they were teaching. And um, so I came back there in, I guess, 1967. And uh, to give you an idea of what it was like, the first week, maybe the second week when I was back, it was a beautiful day. I was walking around, getting to take a look at it. And this very attractive blonde guy um, talked me up, pushed me into a doorway and started necking with me and said, you want to go to a party? And I said, I'll go wherever you take me. <laughs> And so he took me to this party, one of the tall buildings on either side of Jane Street. And we got into it. There was a, a gay cocktail party taking place there, mostly older guys. He dragged me into the bedroom and I thought, OK, here we go. And there was this other guy there. He left me there and the other guy blew me. Wow. And that guy there was Frank O'Hara. Frank O'Hara. Oh, that wow. was Frank O'Hara. <laughs> And the people, and then he said, go enjoy yourself at the party. There's some nice people there. And I maybe he blew somebody else. I don't know. At any rate, <laughs> um, most of the people at the party were older, but there were a couple of people that I'd met before there. So I hung out with them. About a month later, I bumped into Frank on the street and he said, I guess he had seen, seen me with some of my friends there or seen me on the street. And he said, there's a big um, party going on at Robert Indiana's tomorrow night. Here's the address. He wrote it, made me turn around, wrote it on my back. Here's the address. Bring some of your cute friends. <laughs> and so 
this was down in the Bowery. We took a cab. Um, we went down there, and the whole art scene of that, that moment was there. Wow, wow. Well, and then sadly... So, so there were so few gay people mm -hmm. out, and so few who were even half out, like those artists, that you could really know everybody and associate with everybody. Yeah. Well, so like, what were the top spots, you know, um, in Greenwich Village? Or like, where were you really going? To the bars, to the clubs? There were three or four bars, um, Boots, uh, Boots and Boots and Saddles, which we call bras and girdles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there was the Eagle's Nest. Of course. Well, that was up in Chelsea, the Eagle's Nest. Um, those were standbys. There were just a lot of bars open at the end of Christopher Street. There were two or three bars down there. The whole um, of Greenwich Village was a cruising scene. Mm. I mean, there was just no two ways about it. From Fifth Avenue to the Hudson River, from 14th Street down to Washington Square, it was just solid cruising scene, pickup scene, you know, um, and uh, bars, restaurants, a lot of, a lot of restaurants and cafes, uh, theaters, mm. there were all these little theaters, theaters delay, there were two or three other ones that were there. Um, so it was just a gay neighborhood, which changed, you know. Yeah, well, and now, like, I was so curious about you know, I'm not sure if you're reflecting this in your new collection of essays, but like, what do you think about the idea of the gayborhood or gayborhood or even I grew up in South Jersey. So like I would go a lot to Philly's gayborhood, which like still has a strong presence. But, you know, there's Lambertville. Is there's, Woody's still there? Woody's is there. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, there's Lambertville, there's New Hope, there's Asbury Park. Um so like things have really spread out, I feel, with like LGBT sure. communities. Sure. Um, but do you feel like New York City, in some ways, I actually feel that their queer scene, I mean, it's spread throughout Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens. Yeah. Um, what is, is there an importance to the gayborhood? Do you think that it's more important yeah, that- well. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I'm really excited to talk to you all about one of our ITBR sponsors, Broadview Press. Broadview Press is an independent academic publisher in the humanities that produces high-quality, pedagogically useful books for use in university and college classrooms. They publish mainly in English studies, writing, philosophy, and history. They are always publishing with an eye towards diversity, building a strong list of titles from women, people of color, and authors from other marginalized groups. If you haven't heard my Broadview Press interviews, you need to. Recently, I just had on Dr. Shannon Day, who talked about her book, Beyond the Binary, Thinking About Sex and Gender. And in the summer, I had on Dr. Jason Holt, who gave us all a comprehensive history of what it means to be a philosopher who studies sporting culture. And of course, we went back to ancient Greek, literature, mythology, history, to look at the roots of athleticism. And... Last year, I had on Dr. Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock, who's actually going to be coming on the podcast soon to give his thoughts on the new Fall of the House of Usher Netflix series. He talked all about pop culture for beginners. And Broadview Press is offering an exclusive discount because of our sponsorship. So head to broadviewpress.com where you're going to see such a wide range of literature. Use the code Ivory Tower, I V O R Y. T-O-W-E-R for 20% off site-wide all of their books. Again, it's broadviewpress.com. Enjoy your reading. You've all heard me gush about Mandy Made It. Mandy Made It is a craft business and it's actually owned by my friend, Mandy Bengal, who I have known, Mary DePippi has known. We all actually became best friends in Main Stage Center for the Arts Summer Theater Camp. So I'm so proud of Mandy. First, 
She has a an arts festival coming up on April 28th. It's called the Gloucester Township Arts Market and Green Fair. There are going to be art vendors, craft vendors, including Mandy, food trucks. It sounds so much fun. I actually am thinking maybe I'm going to attend. So it's in South Jersey. And it's April 28th, a Sunday from 10 to 3 p.m. So go over to at Mandy Made It to find out more information about how you can attend the festival. And please, if you see Mandy, say, oh, I listened to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And that's how I know about your crochet company. So she makes so many wonderful items, especially because we're in the spring into summer. I know that she makes beautiful spring flowers that she crochets. She's made wonderful Pokemon inspired items. I know that my boyfriend, he's loves Pokemon Go. So this is a great item for him. I actually got my boyfriend, a Mandy made it scream ghost face bouquet for Valentine's day. He loved it. She makes wonderful Disney inspired items. She made me a hocus pocus bed and breakfast item, snow white and the Evil Queen's Poisoned Apple item. I know she's made Married to Pippi so many true crime items. We're in talks right now to have her make some Ivory Tower Boil the Room crochet items. Make sure that you reach out to Mandy Made It. Let her know that you heard this ad on the Ivory Tower Boil the Room. She loves knowing that you're listening to her ad on the podcast. And also she'll give you an exclusive item at Mandy made it on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. It came about because people wanted to be safe. Mm -hmm. Gays wanted to be safe. They wanted to be in a place where they felt safe. Um, and where if I remember at one point there was, there was this uh, semi-institution called the trucks. And these were open semi-trucks that were parked uh, around 14th Street, way over by the Hudson River. And uh, they would be emptied out and for the weekend and gay people would go in there and have sex. And at one point, people were being uh, attacked by uh, kids from um, Chelsea, from the projects in Chelsea and Uptown, and we formed a sort of vigilante committee. And believe it or not, me and Marsha P. Brown <laughs> were on Tuesday nights. And she would be there with her, you know, Afro comb, which was all points, a deadly Afro comb. And I'd be there with my cowboy boots, and I had a, you know, a knife, steak knife in every pocket. And we would protect the trucks for Tuesday night from midnight to 3 p.m. or something, 3 a.m. or something like that. So we formed, it was a vigilante, literally, because it, people were being attacked. And so the people really did protect themselves. There were street communities when uh, the city went broke in the 70s, 1977. Um, there were street associations that started up. And in fact, it was through the Jane Street Association that I found out about all of those gay serial murders, right? Yeah. That's how I found out about it. And I used my contacts there to get actual information, factual information, you know. By the way, di didn't you mention that you were reading my Victorian novel? Well, you never, never did. No, I'm not sure. What is your Victorian novel for everyone oh, listening? Two, at one of them is called Pursuit, uh, Victorian Entertainment, and then its partner is Pursued, Lillian's Story. Oh, yeah. Yes, I yes. You were I'm that. going to. No, I'm about. Yes, I am uh, going to read it. But what is the narrative? Just so you can tease everyone to get their hands um, on. It. I, for a long time. Well, I'm a. I've read all probably every Victorian novel that uh, arrived, but. Um, I became aware in doing that, that there were really two real sexual lives. There was the men's life, which was really open and free. And then the, the, the women's life, which was very, very limited. And I wanted to write about that. And um, I chose a, a narrative in which uh, a woman in her 60s who uh, lives in the, country, in the countryside um, and who was married to the Lord Exchequer of England, 
who resides in London, of course, um, vanishes one evening and he sets one of his young men and uh, to become detective and find out what happened to her. And that is pursuit. And that is the story of this young man who goes in search of her. And uh, he ends up, so we follow his life while he's doing that. And at the end of that, he does connect with her. And the second book is called Pursuit. And it's the story of her supposedly golden marriage to this guy when she was 17, 18 years old and the parson's daughter when he was, you know, the, the duke of this huge area, you know, Ravenglass, you know. So that's the narrative on that, her life as opposed to this young guy's life. And he grew up in a, a ghetto in um, East London, but was a beautiful child. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he went through all kinds of things. So his is very Dickensian yeah. childhood. And hers is more Marianne Evans. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you are like myself, a George Eliot, a you know, are you also a huge Victorian poetry fan? Because one of my yeah, favorites is Christina Rossetti and ah. her brother. Like the yeah. Rossettis are probably some of my favorite. Uh, poets from the Victorian yeah, period. Yeah, I read um, them all. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, well, for everyone out there, Felice, how can they get their hands on all of your work? I know you have a great website. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Uh, by by 2025, all the novels are, will be back in print. Oh, well, that's I'm wonderful. Right to, right to my first book. I'm very indebted to uh, two companies, uh, Requeer Tales is one of them, which has been putting out uh, all my fiction and various other places. Uh, Beautiful Dreamer is putting out my 1985 autobiography. It's being published right now called Ambidextrous, The Secret Lives of Children, a book that was burned on the docks of London when it was sent there. A very banned book, one of my two most banned books. Um, and that's coming out again because it was analog and had to be digital. I actually ended up reading every single word and I now understand why it was so controversial. It's ruthlessly honest. <laughs> What's your other most banned book, Felice? Um, I think like people in history uh, oh. of 1995, my most beloved books when people come up to me and said, I read your book, it changed my life. It was either that or the lure. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So FelicePicano.net is all things, you know, Felice's work. Um, you know, my last question, I mean, we could keep going and going, but, you know, I know you have a schedule. I have a schedule. Hopefully you come back again, Felice. This has been such oh, a wonderful you. conversation. Um, you know, if you can now see, where specifically gay male culture and the literary scene is um, and how even in Hollywood, how embraced to say like a salt burn or call me by your name, like how visible queer male stories are. What would you have thought about our current moment, say in the Rizzoli books? Did you imagine this is what would happen? I hoped it was something that would happen. I mean, I was always openly gay. Really, from the moment I was gay, I was openly gay. I never was apologetic or anything like that. And I'm very, very glad people are waking up. Yeah, well, so and what's your hope? People are opposed to it, as we know. Mm -hmm. Well, so what's your hope for the next, like, 20 years, if you had a magic wand? I hope that all of the media, the visual media, become mature enough to actually turn some of my books into um, film and TV. I would love They're that. They're not there yet. They're not there yet. I've been hoping for a queer production company for a long time that would turn queer novels into films like just keep optioning these books One so, another, yeah, yeah. but right hollywood costs a lot of money as you know does, um yeah. i've got no yes. problem with it it paid my way for years 
when books didn't. So I'm happy about it, though. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much, Felice. And um, any yeah, way for people to contact you, or it's up to you. Like, I don't know. On if my website, media. on the right hand side, it says contact me. And a lot of people do. Please do. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, Felice. This has been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Andrew. And I'll be in New York City next week. Wonderful. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you, Felice. Have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. Bye bye.